Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome here. We are in studio talking sports with Val and a, a round of uh, boys basketball sectionals uh, are done. We're going to be doing semifinal round tonight, and then of course the championship of the sectionals coming up tomorrow, Val. So we're getting down to it. Um, first off, uh, how are you doing? Uh, my voice is recovering. I had some coughing fits on Tuesday night. You might have heard me. And I was even worse on Wednesday when I thankfully was not in front of a microphone. But I'm doing a little bit better now. Good. Good. He... But it is tough when you're... When I was back in my writing days, it didn't matter if I had any coughing fits. I was a writer. Right. Now I talk. And it's very frustrating when you have wor you have some supposedly intelligent words that you think are coming out of your mouth and instead you're just hacking. Makes it a little harder, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's good to see, uh, good to hear that you're kind of on the, the mend because you got uh, at least three games to call here in the next two days. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, going to be a busy time yeah, here. Yeah, bad, bad timing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention, I wanted to give uh, condolences to the families of uh, Tony Runkle and Howard Ruckman, who are really two of the great sports dads in Rochester history. Uh, Tony Runkle passed away on February 18th at the age of 63. Uh, Howard Ruckman passed away on February 26th. Uh, this past Monday, the age of 82. Um, Tony Runkle uh, had two sons uh, who I covered, uh, and Evan and Josh, who played uh, sports at Rochester High School. Uh, both were all-around athletes, but especially good in baseball. Um, Tony was a very, very supportive dad. And then, of course, Tony became a very supportive grandpa. His granddaughter, Lily Gerald, is somebody we know really well. And yeah. Lily, a great wrestler, so... Our condolences to the uh, the friends and family of Tony Runkle, and then Howard Ruckman, um, maybe maybe the all time greatest Rochester sports dad. Really, I mean, he's Steve Ruckman's dad. Um, Howard, uh, uh, he opened uh, Trelane's upholstery shop here in Rochester. I think he owned that business for like forty years. Um, then down, moved down to Evansville uh, for his later years to follow his grandchildren. Uh, of course, Howard's son, Steve, uh, you know, a great all-around star, uh, scored, what, 53 points in a basketball game against Peru, was a member of the 1987 state championship football team. Um, funny guy, just a great fu fun dude to be around. And then yeah. uh, Howard's grandson, uh, Blake Ruckman, was on that 2015 Evansville Wrights team that Lost to Homestead and Biggie Swanigan in the state championship game. Yeah. Blake Ruckman turned out to be a – he was a very good basketball player as well. Uh, I think Blake was also a really good golfer, if hmm. I recall. So, uh, Howard – if you've been around Rochester sports for uh, any, any sort of time, you know who Howard Ruckman is. He and Trelane were were married for 59 years, so our, our hearts go out to the Ruckman family yeah. uh, at this t a tough time. So, we just want to see we're thinking of them. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we want to mention that there's a change in the volleyball state tournament format that came out, and I tweeted about it uh, last night. Uh, they're going back to a one-game regional and a two-game semi-state yeah. instead of the opposite. So Doing, we'll see how that works. I, I, are they going to do it like the basket? They didn't say kind of the format. Obviously, it was like that where we had the Tuesday night regional for many years, and then the Saturday semi-state where you had to win two games in one day. I'm wonder, wondering if I, – I don't think they're going back to that. I think because – there were some real travel concerns with that. I mean, we had to travel to Covington, right, from Rochester to Covington on a Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they want to do that. I, I'm kind of wondering if they're going to do it like the basketball state tournament, where they may pick out eight venues to host a regional, and then each regional will host two regional matches. They could be of different classes. I'm kind of wondering if that's where they're going to go with this. Yeah, similar to what they're doing in basketball. That that could be interesting too. Are they are they looking to if you if they do that, obviously that would shrink the the tournament down by a week. If they do the Tuesday Saturday thing, so mm -hmm. are they looking to do that, or are they just uh, looking to go more into the style that they have with basketball now? Seems to be pretty uh, working pretty well in basketball. So yeah. that might be what they're looking to do with volleyball as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I hope they keep Frankfurt as a site because that's that was a great venue for for the volleyball semi state that we mm -hmm. went to. I mean. You, Fans are really right down on top of the action. So Frankfurt's just a good gym for anything. I mean, yeah, it's just a, it's a great gym. Yeah, beyond beyond looking back and what they've done there, but uh, it's just a really cool gym. Yeah, 
By the way, they also, the IHSA Executive Committee also had a vote if they would like to seed the volleyball sectionals, and that vote failed by a vote of 19-0. to So you like to see volleyball sectionals seeded, not going to happen. Yeah. That was just for volleyball? Just for volleyball. That, the, that vote was for? Yeah. Okay. And we should mention softball practice starts Monday. So? Yeah. <laughs> I know there are a lot of people who are really anticipating that. Certain times of the week last week, it seemed like a, a good springtime. And <laughs> certain times of the week last week, it was like, okay, here's winter again. Right. And it was about 12 hours in between. <laughs> might we have an out, Might they have outdoor practice next? That's the real... Yeah, it's supposed play. to get warm again. It's supposed, it's supposed to, be to get really the, warm. In the 60s uh, yeah. early next week, so who knows? Yeah. Um, outdoor practice might be a possibility. Outdoor practice, and then when they come back for their first game after spring break, it'll be snowing. Right. <laughs> it's just the way it works here. Yeah. All right. So um, let's get into it. Let's talk some Rochester Zebras basketball. Before we get into uh, sectional talk, they had a big game at uh, Rochester to finish off the regular season on Friday night. Val, you were there. I was down at Pioneer uh, Friday night, but I got in the car after uh, after the Pioneer game was over, and you guys were still going. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was a long game, but I was very shocked uh, when I found out the score at the time. I mean, it was uh, an impressive performance for the uh, Rochester Zebras. It absolutely was, and... Um, you know, it was it was interesting the way the game got started. McConaughey's pressure really had a lot of impact uh, in the first quarter. Rochester, I think, jumped out to like a seven nothing lead right away, and then McConaughey's the, the kind of the teeth of their press really started bothering Rochester. AJ Kelly is so quick, and they get buckets uh, in transition all the time. But the thing is, is that if they don't get steals that you could break their press and get uh layups as well and then uh you know rochester uh they got up to i think it was 13 to 6 um early in the second quarter mcconnick was up 19 18 um josiah ball uh had 31 on the night but rochester kept matching them basket for basket and then there was a key period of time in the second quarter Rochester had three threes and three consecutive possessions. That was one by Tanner Reinerts. And then the next one, this is going to be another three by Tanner. Nothing but that, and all of a sudden Rochester was up by six, and the run kept continuing. This is just a great play by Drew Bowers. First the steal, then the pull-up, then the little bank shot. Rochester was up by 13 at that point. They led by 12 at the half. And you, know, you were kind of waiting for the McConaughey run in the second half, but it never happened. Rochester kept making shot after shot. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned that uh, play there by Drew Bowers. I I like watching Drew Bowers. Mm-hmm. He is so fundamentally solid. Mm-hmm. You know, just little things like that bank shot. Yeah. I, mean, I just love watching him play. Yeah. That was a great left-handed finish by Jonas Kaiser off a nice pass by Grant Clark. Grant Clark was really good in this game. Um, he was a fe- you know, he's a, just a big body. But he's really he's really more skilled than just kind of a big guy. He he can shoot a little bit. He can finish a Dylan Hook. Just terrific in this game. He had 12 points. He was really effective in top of that 2-3 zone. They kept getting um they rebounded effectively. And then again here the defense for it forces a steal. Kaiser with a finish on the break. This was right after McConaughey had cut it to 10, maybe you're thinking, wondering, are they going to make the run now? Nope, never happened. Uh, yeah, and again, the other thing we talked about is McConaughey, they wound up shooting a lot of, and Ethan Zeiser was terrific for them. He had 16 in support of balls, 31. But boy, they, they shot a lot of long twos in this game. And then when Rochester was able to run out the clock, too, they, they really protected the ball. Well, when you know when you knew McConaughey was going to bring the heat defensively, mm-hmm. but Ra- again, Rochester handled it well, and they won 80, 87 to seventy. Yeah, yeah, eighty-seven points were the most Rochester scored in a game since December of two thousand eight. Yeah, that's been a couple of years. Yeah, but that was the, <laughs> wow. the team that made the state finals with Grimm and Shane and mm-hmm. and Austin Lowe and and uh, Evan Hoff and those guys. So Colt Meadows, those guys. 
So I, I read a post on Twitter, and I was really shocked. So Kelly and Kyle are coming. They're juniors? Yeah. Okay. I, I thought for sure that those guys were seniors. It seems like they've been playing forever. I knew Josiah had another year, but they said, well, uh, A.J. Kelly and, and Fuddy Kyle will be back, you know, with, with uh, Josiah Ball. I'm like, can they really just be juniors? It seems yeah. like they've been around forever, but um, – you know, I think Fuddy Kyle made a made a pretty good impression right out of the gate as a freshman on the football field. Right, so right. So that that's probably why it seems like he's been around. Forever. And I think AJ Kelly made the track state finals as a freshman too. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, just makes it seem like it's been longer than that, I guess. But boy, what a great feeling for Rochester coming off of that after the way that yeah. uh, they played down in McConaughey last year. Right. They, remember, they lost eighty to thirty one yeah. at McConaughey yeah. last year. They lost by forty nine. So it was a 66-point turnaround in one year's time. I mean, obviously, Bauer Maple graduated, but you still have, you know, obviously, Josiah Ball leading the state. The whole McConaughey team was leading the state in scoring. Josiah Ball leading the state individually in scoring. So you, you knew that uh, they were potent again on offense. And I would say that not only the 87 points that uh, Rochester scored on offense, but the holding them to 60 on defense. 70. 70, 70, yeah. 17, yeah, they, 70. They, they averaged 76. Yeah, but, I mean, they really did a nice job on, on them defensively as well. Right. They held they held Fuddy Kyle to, I think, uh, four points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they did a good job on him, and they just had to shoot about a foot farther out than what they wanted. Mm-hmm. And, of course, when you make baskets, too, you can, you can really – that helps you set up your defense as well. And I thought Rochester's 2-3 zone was pretty good. I mean, Dylan Hook – for can really move his feet well, so you put him on top of the zone with Kaiser. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a lot of length on top of a two three zone that it can really give give teams some problems. Yeah, I saw Dylan's dad just a little bit ago here. He works at RTC and he was in the office doing some work, and I, I was just I told him I was very impressed at the way that Dylan really came on the last three or four games. I mean, yeah, he really became a big part of that team. Not that he wasn't before, but. He just uh, he really is going to be one of those guys now that you're like, oh, darn, you know, he's graduating because uh, yeah. he was uh, very, very good the last few games. So. Yeah, yeah. So the Zebras hoping to take some momentum. By the way, that was a really good crowd, too. That was one of the better crowds they've had in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Because we were kind of wondering, you know, this game doesn't really mean a whole lot. The conference championship's not on the line in this game. But yeah, that was a really great crowd, and they're really appreciative. They, they knew how well they, they played. Yeah, yeah. So trying to uh, take that momentum into uh, sectional play on Tuesday as the Zebras would open things up down at Lewis Cass High School. First game of the quarterfinals, they have the Wabash Apaches. And Val, I think you and I can probably both look back at this. This Whoever won this game, which obviously ends up being Wabash, but uh, they're probably going to win that. We, we kind of looked at that going in. That, that's what we thought. The and favored anyway. Yeah. And this game was... I guess a classic sectional game in that, in terms of kind of like the tension involved in the back and forth of the game. The story of the first quarter was Wabash's hot shooting. Specifically, it was Trevor Daughtry's hot shooting. You know, and they're they're shooting 22 footers, 23 footers. I mean, you can only play defense for, you know, so much of the floor, and they were just nailing them from way out there. I mean, there's a there's another long three, and they're just right. Owen Prater got off to a hot start, but yeah, it was Wabash shooting, and then they would they would get up in the lane and then kick back out. Daughtry off the dribble. Wabash closed the first quarter in a 9-0 run on three threes. They led 19 to 11. Rochester had a really good second quarter. I thought Rochester did a really good job, uh, even with as well as Wabash was shooting the ball. I thought that they stayed fairly close. You know, you saw the yeah. the last two regular season matchups between Wabash and Rochester, where Wabash would get you know eighteen, nineteen points up, mm-hmm. and they they didn't uh, allow that you know here on uh, Tuesday. Three pointers and back to back possessions by Bazo and Kaiser gave Rochester a 22 21 lead. Rochester would tie it at 24. And here's another three things this is Grant Ford 
Put Wabash up 27-24. Bazo had a big game yeah. there. A couple of uh, big shots for the senior Robert Bazo. Yeah, he had six off the bench. That bucket by Daughtry gave Wabash a 29-27 lead at halftime. Third quarter, very good quarter for Wabash. They held Rochester to, I believe it was uh, seven points this quarter. It was at six. And then they, uh, Ford hits the three, and Wabash goes up by 11, 45, 34. It's looking bleak, and then Rochester goes on an 8-0 run. I know Kaiser hit a three, and that what a nice play by Prater going back door. The Wabash defender just turned his head for a second, and then Prater hits the free throw to complete the three-point play. It's down to three at 45-42. They would get it to a 47-44. Four and then 47 45, the layup by Dinkins made a 51 45. Three pointer by Reinerts, 51 48. But those would be the last points of the season for the Zebras. Wabash would close it out from the foul line and they would win it 56 to 48. But I think in my article I said, you know, you hope you, hope you have a chance to win at the end. Rochester had four chances. Mm-hmm. They had two looks at a three pointer down by three. They had uh, basically about a five, I, wouldn't, I don't know if you call it a bunny, but like about a three footer. Mm-hmm. Right at the goal, down by two, they would have tied it. And then they had a, um, Prater had a drive to the basket, but Vogel really defended that play. Caden Vogel really defended that play well for Wabash. They would have tied it. And just uh, just one of those. I, in, them, in a lot of ways, that's kind of what what made it a kind of a classic sectional game where both teams are in it and you're, you're feeling you have the chance till the very, very end. Yeah. And you talked about the crowd against McConaughey, a very good crowd there on uh, Tuesday night as well. And of course, by the end of that game, then you have you know some fans that are filtering in that are there to watch the, the second game. Yeah. So you know it starts to feel like the gym's pretty full. So nice crowd down there. You know Lewis Cass does a great job hosting sectionals down there. It's a great uh, great gym. I know you said in the pregame, you know some people like shooting there and some people don't. But mm. uh, you know from a from a fan standpoint, from a broadcasting standpoint, it's a nice place to have a sectional. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, I wanted to compliment too. Daughtry's defense on Drew Bowers. Mm-hmm. I thought his defense was really good. Yeah. You know, both guys are on the same height, around five eight, five nine. But you know, Daughtry, he's you know, he, he's got kind of the is for a real thin, skinny kid at five eight, five nine. He's got a little football player in him, mm-hmm. and he's. Well, I don't know if you'd call Wabash the most physical team, but they're they're physical enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought Daughtry. I mean, everything that Drew got, it it was a a chore. He had to work for it. Right. For sure. Isaac Wright, who averaged just sixteen, was held to eight, mm-hmm. but he had a big block on Tanner Reinerts late in the game as well. Yeah. And I, coach Coach Wright really said that was a big play from his standpoint. That was a big play that block on Reinerts because Tanner doesn't get a shot blocked very often. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, three seniors are going to be uh, graduating from this team, but they're going to have a lot of players coming back next year. So really looking forward to uh, seeing what they can do. A lot of juniors and sophomores on this team this year. Next year, they'll be seniors and juniors. So I think there, there, there's no reason why this team can't be good for the next two years. Yeah. And But they're going to have to up their level of play because the TRC, it was a really good conference this year, and it will be probably even better next year. When you had Northwestern, yeah, and um, yeah, Lewis Cass is always going to be, you, you know, know, Lewis Cass will be competitive, yeah, and uh, yeah, so they're going to have to up their level of play. But I think they're, I, I think they're up to the challenge. Yeah, McConaughey is going to be, <laughs> they're going to be right there again next year, obviously with those three juniors, right? And I think they're going to be able to, again, you know, one thing talking with Coach Wright. He goes, boy, they keep you up at night when you prepare for them because you just don't know what defense is coming at you. Mm-hmm. They go from man to 2-3 to, to a trap to a full-court press, and I'm sure th- they'll have the versatility to be able to do that again next year. Yep. All right, let's take a, a quick break and uh, come back. We'll talk about the Argus and the Culver boys basketball teams here on Talking Sports with Val. We'll be right back. Kriskin's Pools and Spas is your local contractor for all your pool and hot tub installation needs. With a wide selection to choose from, Kriskin's is sure to hook you up with exactly what you need no matter what your budget is. To learn more about our services, visit Kriskin'sPoolsAndSpas.com, 
Call 574-857-3100 or stop on by at 7448 Liberty Avenue in Fulton to see how Criskins can help you. Here we go, Billy. Swing hard. As your local agent, I know you. I know every Saturday your son Billy plays Little League. We sponsor his team. And we know you love parking way too close to the field. That's why we tailor a unique policy for you and your car. Because sometimes something from out of left field can literally come from out of left field. That's simple human sense. Ask the Jennings Insurance Agency in Argus and Rochester if auto owners make sense for you. Looking for an easy way to provide custom branded products for your business, school, sports team, or fundraising event? Let the Winning Edge set up a customized web store that features branded products tailored to your business, school, church, or charitable cause. With a wide variety of customizable apparel, sports accessories, office accessories, and custom tumblers, the Winning Edge is sure to provide you with the best style that suits you. Find your edge by calling 574-223-6090 or going to our website, thewinningedgeathletics.com, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Hello, sir. How can I help you today? I'm looking for a special gift. We have no tolerance for tomfoolery today. What do you mean, tomfoolery? What I said was, we have a nice selection of jewelry today. Oh. May I suggest that you give my friends at Affordable Hearing a call? Affordable Hearing offers hearing testing and unique solutions for everybody. We guarantee the lowest prices in the area and now have offices in Rochester and Logansport to serve you better. Call to book an appointment today. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val for a Friday afternoon as we get ready for some sectional semifinal action coming up here tonight. For the Argus Dragons and, and Culver Cavaliers, their seasons both came to a close on Wednesday at Triton, losing in the quarterfinal round there at uh, sectional 50. Uh, for the uh, Culver Cavaliers, a rematch of uh, a game they played just last week against a conference rival and the host, Triton Trojans. And Culver... Uh, really looked like they played pretty well in that one. They did not lose by a lot. I mean, they played Triton pretty tough in both games. Yeah, um, it was when they played last week. It was forty-one thirty-six, and it was kind of, uh, you know, Jack Rogers was able to get Triton into foul trouble. This game, the second game, the sectional game, was a totally different type of game, and it's it's funny because usually uh, sectional games are slower and yeah, uh, it's tougher to get baskets and. Uh, it, it's more physical. This game, this time, it was the opposite. Uh, neither team could miss could miss in the first quarter. Gage Riffle was just on fire. He had six threes in like the first quarter and a half. Really? He had three threes in the first quarter. And then in the second quarter, I think he had three threes on like three consecutive possessions. Just hmm. bang, bang, bang. And all of a sudden... Culver, they were just playing from behind the rest of the way, and against Triton's defense, a six-seven eight-point deficit. It's more than a six. It feels like more than a six or seven or eight-point mm -hmm. deficit because they just make things so tough on you. Yeah. But Culver kept battling and battling and battling. I mean, they they fell behind by fourteen, and they got it down to I think think they got it down to seven. I think they got it down to six, but uh, Triton was able to make enough free throws and enough plays in the end, and Triton wound up winning the game uh, 61 to 54. Jack Rogers, you know, again, Jack, I, I give so much credit to Jack because he gets a lot of physicality thrown at him. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, he, he and he just continues. To, he's just fearless in terms of how he drives the lane. He had 16 in that first game against Triton last week. He had 21 in this game, and then Andrea Guasp, uh, he had, you know he had four threes. He had 12 points. Uh, he really finished his uh, his lone season out at Culver on a really strong note. He really looked good. Uh, if anything, you you almost wish he, he shot more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, David Height had nine. You know David he played in that first game and he didn't score. And I. I asked Kyle Evans about it uh, after the game. He goes, yeah, that game last week, his hip was hurting so bad that we weren't sure that he, he could barely walk, much less play basketball. Hmm. He was doing, while he wasn't 100% this past Wednesday, he was doing better. Yeah. Uh, but 
you could tell David his shot was maybe a little bit off. But again, we we've talked about David. I mean, the improvement that he made yeah. to become a real factor, and I'm sure he's going to be somebody who gets some all conference recognition when the season's over. Yeah, and unfortunately, the uh, Cavaliers in their season with a nine and fourteen record really started off pretty promising. I, I think they were what seven and two at one point, something in that neighborhood, uh, something like that. Yeah, I don't know if Six they were and seven two and two. Or... Yeah. I mean, it was kind of seven and four. I think maybe a lot of really close. Seven five, yeah, there were a lot of really close games there down the stretch that uh, they just weren't able to get the W's in. And right, I also think their schedule gets a little tougher in January um, uh, and February. Uh, yeah, they, it, it was interesting. Their scoring average went up from forty five last year to fifty six this year, mm-hmm. which I think was kind of surprising because you know, boy, you graduate Shane Schumann and you graduate Ethan Keller and you graduate. Uh, those got you know a pretty group of kids, a group of kids that played together a lot. What's this team going to look like? Well, their scoring average went up by eleven. Unfortunately, their defensive average went from forty-one to fifty-eight. Mm-hmm. Now that's part of the part of it is just their style of play. They played just a lot faster. Um, I, you know, I talked with Coach Evans, and we talked about yeah, Kyle Evans' dad was, was a basketball coach, and he takes some of what he learned from that. But one of those other mentors is John Burris who's the coach at McConaughey, but back in the day, uh, Kyle Evans coached in the middle school program at Southwood when John Burris was the coach there, learned a lot from John Burris. And he said he he said it's kind of, Coach Evans said it's kind of like a modified John Burris system that he runs mm-hmm. with that zone that zone pressure that he runs and kind of the offense that they run. Yeah. And it's really, cre- it's really a unique style of play. Not many teams play like that except for maybe, well, McConaughey. Yeah. But it's maybe not as... All out, and they don't have a Josiah Ball type, but yeah, I mean, there were there were some highs and there were some low. Yeah, so there was some really nice wins, but I think uh, weren't able to get a ton of defensive stops. Uh, you know, they had lost to Bremen fifty eight thirty five in their last regular season game. Uh, so yeah, d- didn't finish the regular season strong, and then again a game effort, but they lose to Triton sixty one fifty four. So the uh, the Argus Dragons were up next on Wednesday night, taking on Westville, and um, it seemed like a, a game of runs. Yeah, uh, this one was about uh, the the key to the game was the start. Westville leads twenty three to eight after the first quarter, and Argus was just kind of swimming upstream the rest of the game. Uh, they really, again. Kudos to Caden Pepper from Westville. He is a star. I mean, he averages 19. He had 19, and it was like an easy 19. It was like if they needed him to score 25 or 30, he could have done that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's 6'4", so if he rises up for a jump shot, you're just not – you're just kind of hoping he misses, Mm -hmm. and he doesn't miss very often. But he's got a nice – he's a pretty good ball handler for 6'4". And so he can kind of dribble to his spot, mm-hmm. and he's got a nice mid-range jump shot. Uh, his younger brother, okay, Caden's a senior. His younger brother, Caleb Pepper, is a junior. Caleb is he's more of a role player, but a good defender. And then their their little point guard, five eight, Gavin Hannon. Boy, he is a pest on defense, and he gets their fast break going. And then they bring in a six six guy off the bench, Ishmael Kane, six six off the bench. Hmm. And he had 12 points and 8 rebounds. He had two dunks. You don't see a 6'6 kid coming off the bench on a 1A team very often. No, no. <laughs> Usually you're going to run everything right around them. Yeah. I mean, you're going you're gonna to focus your offense, your defense, everything on that kid. Right. Yeah. And then they surround the two Peppers and Kane with shooters. Mm-hmm. So they've got, a lot, they've got a lot of things you've got to worry about. And, again, Argus had a nice second quarter. They... They go on a 10-0 run. They cut it from 17 down to 7. Uh, they're still only down by 10 at the half. Argus had gone. They started out, man, they realized that wasn't working, so into a zone. The 2-3 zone was effective at times, but then the game gets away again in the third quarter. And, again, you've got Sean Richard, who was basically, I mean, he was going on what he was taking. He and Luke Stoltz were taking on Westville 2-on-5. on 5 mm mm-hmm. But the freshmen were really struggling to get involved in the game and really struggling to contribute. Uh, and again, Hayden Hensler, I, I appreciate what he, how much better he's gotten, but he's, again, he's not a big time scorer. Uh, 
but again, Aiden does. He did a lot to. He, he try. I mean, he you know again rebounding and ball handling. He really improved at and trying to set up his teammates. But again, Westville just had too many weapons, and you know they, I think they got a, a, you know third quarter they regained momentum. They the lead was up to like twenty two early in the fourth quarter, and they wound up winning by sixteen at sixty six fifty. But again, Sean Richard thirty one points against a, a defense that was obviously obviously if you're playing Ar- Argus. Sean Richards going to be at the top of your scouting report. He's still at 31. Yeah. I think he averaged 24 a game for the year. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a what a year Sean had. Right. Yeah, I mean, you got to give kudos to uh to Sean Richard and uh to coach Breeden, you know, the Dragons finishing at 9 and 14 mm-hmm. uh no, 10 and 13. Um uh, that's a yeah. um you know, that's a big um, accomplishment for them, obviously, with uh, you know Sean and, and Luke basically being the only two that really had much experience. You got three freshmen basically that were you know in and out of the starting lineup all year long. Uh, great coaching job by Jason Breeden, and you know what a what a job of leadership by Sean Richard. Yeah, I mean, I remember Sean playing, getting some varsity minutes as a freshman and a sophomore. And if you would have told me he'd, he'd score over eight hundred and fifty points in his career, I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. He scored over 500 points this season. Yeah, and you 500 is usually a it's kind of a big number. If you get to 500 for a season, mm-hmm. you've had a heck of a season. Yeah, and you know to step up and and really take on that role as the point guard and and really handle that. He did a great job. Yeah, and you know I again I give Luke Stoltz credit for 12 12 points and seven rebounds. This was one of the few teams that might have had more size than him. Mm-hmm. Than, than so again, and and you know Luke became a really good passer. Because if you want to get, to get Sean the ball, you have to be a good passer, and because of the attention that Luke drew, and you know, it's kind of reminded me a little bit of watching the way JJ Morris got better as a passer during his time, because of the attention that he drew. And I think with Luke, it's kind of the same way. Yeah. Well, it's just going to get uh, more attention next year because uh, you know, with Sean graduating, that uh, he's going to be the main focus for a lot of defenses. Yeah. Yeah. And kudos to Gabe McMillan. I mean, we haven't talked much about Gabe, but he really came and gave gave a nice effort on defense. <laughs> no, not a big time score, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how they grow. We'll see how they grow now as players. It's it's big off season for Argus. Yeah. When you you know, it's hard to believe there are no more Richards anymore, yeah. and they're going to be missed. Yeah. All right, let's take another quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about the uh, Pioneer Panthers and Winnemac Warriors in our next segment here on Talking Sports with Val. Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to set you up with a new set of wheels. From coming on the lot to driving off in your new dream car, Mike Anderson strives to give you the smoothest dealership experience. Not only that, but Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to lend a hand with their service center to keep your ride running. Stop on in for a test drive or call today at 574-223-2711 to see how Mike Anderson in Rochester can steer you in the right direction. Since 1974, Steve Moore Agency has provided the City of Rochester with customized insurance solutions that will fit your needs. With a variety of coverage policies for business, home, auto, life, and more, Steve Moore Agency is sure to cover all your insurance needs. Call now at 574-223-3010 or stop on in at 602 East 9th Street to see what Brody Moore at Steve Moore Agency can do for you. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, we strive to provide our community with a better alternative. We respect the many choices our patients have when it comes to health care needs. When they choose us, we go above and beyond to offer them personalized service and care that will consistently remind them of why we are a superior choice to other pharmacies. Pharmacy care should be proactive when possible. It should be customized to patient needs. It should strive for better health outcomes. It should help manage costs. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, our mission is to provide the pharmacy care you deserve. Fulton County REMC is proud to offer the Operation Roundup Charitable Giving Program. Through Operation Roundup, Fulton County REMC is able to give to local organizations and communities by simply rounding up your monthly bill and donating the change. Since its inception, Operation Roundup has generated over $50 million in charitable donations throughout 260 electric cooperatives. To learn more about this great program, visit www.fultoncountyremc.com or call in at 574-223-3156. 
Welcome back here, talking sports with Val on a Friday afternoon. Let's talk some uh, Pioneer Panthers and Winnemac Warriors uh, before we get into our action from Tuesday for Winnemac. Let's go back and take a look at the uh, final game of the regular season for the Pioneer Panthers as they hosted West Central at home on Saturday, coming off of a senior night loss on Friday night at home to the uh, – Tri-County Cavaliers, who we'll see tonight at yeah, Gaston. Yeah, it, it was kind of a rough night, losing 52-32 to Tri-County the previous night, but I think that only motivated uh, Pioneer to really want to finish strong. Uh, West Central had uh, Jaden Miller. He he had a really good game. He had 21 for them. Uh, but Pioneer was really, for a team that had scored only 32 points the previous night, they were... Really on it offensively. They really kind of broke the game open. This was a layup by Bryce Nanenga of West Central. That turned out to be his only field goal of the game. He only had four points. Nanenga came in averaging 19. And he, Nanenga did not score after the first quarter in this game. That was a three-pointer by Miller that tied the game. It was 13-12 to at the end of the first quarter. And then Pioneer goes on a 13-0 run to start the second quarter. Lucas Perry has really become uh, a force on offense. He can handle it a little bit. He can score with his left hand. Micah Rands had six points. Um, uh, so they get out to, it was 26-12. And then early in the third quarter, that is Rands picking, a, picking the pocket of a West Central ball handler and going in for a layup. Uh, I believe the lead was 12 at the half, and then Pioneer gets off to a strong start. Braden Erickson was very, very good in this game. You know, with again, we we know Drew McKegg is somebody you can rely on to score in double figures, but when Pioneer gets three kids in double figures with the way they play defense, they're going to be tough to beat. I think it was uh, 16 for McKegg, 13 for Perry, and 11 for Erickson. Yeah. So it, it was, you know, that, uh, and the thing is, is that uh, when West Central ran out to the three-point shooters, Pioneer could just drive by them. And mm -hmm. getting some shots going in the paint. So, they, um, and of course, Drew McKegg is just great at that. I mean, mm -hmm. if you run out of Drew McKegg and take away his three, he almost likes that. Yeah. I mean, because he, he, he that, that just motivates him to just get into the paint, off the dribble, and 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 find ways to score there. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, but the, and again, I thought the key was the defense on Nenenga. I mean, he's had some big games this year. He scored. He's a thousand point scorer, mm -hmm. and they held him to four. Yeah. And Pioneer wound up winning 58-35. to And the crowd just went nuts for uh, Brody Howard and Lane Weldy, who both hit three-pointers in the fourth quarter. Back-to-back mm -hmm. -back possessions. That was awesome. Yeah. So uh, give me a little bit different uh, opponent, though, tonight as they open up their sectional play yeah. at uh, Lewis Cass in game one of the semifinal against the Wabash Apaches. Yeah. I mean, this, this again, if you're – this is a Wabash team that starts five seniors. I mean, while West Central was fairly young – this is a Wabash team that starts five seniors. They're going to be a little bit more physical. No, they're going to be a lot, a lot more, more. They're going to be a lot more physical. Yeah. And uh, how? Now, I talked with Coach right afterwards. I, I said, "What do you know about Pioneer?" He goes, "I really don't know much. I'll be watching a lot of film." But <coughs> he said, "He said I know Coach's son is a really good player." Now, Isaac Wright scored only eight points the other night against Rochester, but he did a good job defensively. I, <coughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they put Wright on McKeg at the start of the game just to see what happens. Yeah, and he's what six three, Isaac. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, he's a football six three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he's he's really strong. So, can, and he can and he's got the wheels to to keep up. I think with with Drew right. too. I mean, he's so. a football quarterback. Yeah. I mean, he's probably the best athlete in the school at Wabash. Yeah. If we were to guess. Yeah. Or at least up. He's certainly up there. So. Uh, that's going to be one thing that Pioneers are going to have to deal with. The other thing is, um, you know, can can Pioneer get in the paint and then defensively, and then maybe this is the real key, can Pioneer's zone stop Wabash's shooters? That's what that's what's really, I, I would imagine, if Coach McKegg has lost any sleep over the past couple of days, it's, oh, my gosh, this team makes a lot of three-pointers and we play a zone. Yeah. Our zone's going to be half to – have to be on their toes the whole night because this is a Wabash team that probably has burned a lot of zones all year well, with a three-point shooting ability with Ford 
who I believe is Wabash's all-time leader in three-pointers yeah. made. Yeah. And then Daughtry hit four threes the other night, and Wright can shoot the three. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to extend that zone way out there because we saw in that highlight with uh, the Rochester and Wabash game where, you know, Wabash was shooting those threes. It was just crazy long. Right. So. And when Daughtry drives to the – Daughtry doesn't drive to the basket a ton, but he's selective when he does it, and he picks the spots, and he usually picks the right time to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. I mean, Pioneer, they're going to have to be definitely on their their A game and probably have to hope for uh, a little bit of a drop-off from the Wabash team after winning against Rochester on uh, Tuesday. Yeah. Now, I talked with Braden Erickson after the West Central game, and he was like, I asked him about finishing the year 5-2. and they went five and two in the month of February. That started with that big win yeah. at North Judson, and he, if anything, he was like, "Man, we should have run the table." Yeah, because we should have gone seven and zero. Oh. So yeah. again, I, th- I think there's, again, you know, you can debate that, but what it does say is that they're confident at Pioneer. Yeah, and you can tell that they're really gelling together at this time. So yeah. that'll be interesting. Game number one, uh, Pioneer and Wabash. Game number two. Uh, Winnemac taking on the host Lewis Cass Kings for Winnemac. They had to uh, they had to get by North Miami on Tuesday night in the second quarterfinal round game. Uh, North Miami, uh, boy, they put up a really good fight. Yeah, North Miami got up to a great start. They were up twelve to four early in the game, uh, and Jake Riley was just fantastic. I mean, he had a you know he had like Shaq like numbers, twenty nine points and thirteen rebounds. Um, Drew Wright, he, you know, he was a kid who we've again. North Miami doesn't start anybody taller than five eleven, so Drew Wright is basically their, their center, yeah, five eleven. But he's a center who can shoot threes. Um, and so again, that that was a three. I, I think that was Riley. So they get up twelve to four, um, but Winnemac kind of slowly inched their way back in. Jace Bennell was really good in the first half. Yes, I think he was their first half MVP. Uh, you could argue. Uh, right there might be their second half MVP, number five, Justin Potoff. Yeah, and then Potoff. Uh, again, you know, Potoff has just gotten a lot more aggressive, and I, I asked Mike Springer after the game, why did you decide to put Potoff in the starting lineup? He goes, he was just he was just deserving of it. Yeah. He goes, by starting, we gave him about five five or six more minute, minutes of playing time a game, and his ability to score off the bounce was really impressive. Now, North Miami led 21-11 at one point, but it was uh, Winnemac who played really well toward the end of the quarter. Uh, they were at 25-18, and then they scored the last seven points of the half to get it to 25-25 at halftime. And that is a three by Bentzel that's kind of started that run. And then this is a basket. Uh, it was kind of a kind of a crazy scramble situation. But it's Potoff that little has a tra- I think that was Potoff who scored, or was it Will Malco? I think it was Potoff. I think it, I think it was Malco. Yeah, you know, Will Malco that tied it at twenty-five. Uh, North Miami goes to the post. Riley gets a bucket to start the second half, twenty-seven twenty-five. North Miami, and then Winnemac goes on a ten-zero run. That might have been the biggest run of the game. You know, one of the things too that uh, kind of hampered uh, Winnemac in the first half was, uh, yeah. you know, Hines got. In really, really early, early foul trouble, picked yeah. up his second foul with over five minutes to go in the first period. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hines was big in the second half. He finished with eleven, uh, but again, Wright hits a three pointer. They're back within five at thirty eight, thirty three. Was that Riley again, I think? Get it yeah, he just went 40, crazy. 44 38. I mean, fourth quarter. He was scoring in the post. He was hitting threes. Well, he was he went crazy the whole game. But yeah. again, in the fourth quarter, went real. Then there was a big drive at a basket by Hines. Again, here's uh, Lake Musaw getting a bounce on a three pointer high off the rim, off the backboard, and in. They would get it down to 52 48. And then for this bucket, 54-50 by Riley. So they got it down to four, but they never got it down to one possession, and it was, again, great free throw shooting. This was Bentel hitting the free throw. They'll make it a five-point lead, and Winnemac would go on to win 55-50. So Winnemac back to 500 to 12-12, and 12, 
And North Miami finishes the season 3-19. and 19. North Miami has not won a sectional game since 2011. Yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, Lewis Cass in uh, Winnemac tonight? Uh, this is going to be, um, I think it's going to be a pretty slow game. Uh, if you like a lot of points, this might not be the game for you. Uh, this could be the first team to 40, 40 or 45 will win. Uh, I don't think either team will want to play too fast. I really like Winnemac's discipline on, de- on offense. Uh, they, 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 they made sure they took good shots. They weren't afraid to take some time off the clock. Um, again, it could come down to can somebody get some buckets in transition, can s- some easy buckets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious to see if your coach Springer, it's how do you defend LJ Hillis? They played a lot of man against North Miami. They might play a lot more zone in this game uh, because Hillis is he's just a tough matchup for them at six four. Uh, you know, uh, get Aiden Jimenez. Uh, could be a matchup in terms of physicality, but even he's giving up a couple inches in height. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then I think the other thing is, can Winnemac bother Lewis Cat? Can can Winnemac bother Trey Johnson as he brings the ball up the court mm-hmm. and not let them get into their offense? Yeah, the kid who's been coming on for uh, Lewis Cass is Bryce Rudd, and he's a nice player. And then Brody Hillis has been playing pretty right. well for them too. Right. He had a big um, game in that first game yeah. against Rochester. Hard to believe this is the first time they played in three years, almost three years ago to the day, March 2nd, 2021. <coughs> uh, they played in a sectional game at Delphi. We mm-hmm. were there for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis Cass won that game 38-22. to They really shut down Russell Compton that night. So, uh, again, hard to believe they haven't played in three years, but we'll yeah. see how they do tonight. Yeah, we'll have both games from Lewis Cass tonight with uh, Pioneer taking on Wabash in Game 1 and then uh, Lewis Cass and Winnemac in Game 2. Yeah, but it, that's going to be a real coach's X's and O's game of chess, I think. Yeah. All right, we're going to take another break here. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about Caston and Tippecanoe Valley. Both teams will open up sectional play at home tonight. They're both hosting their sectionals, so... We're going to talk about those two when we come back here on Talking Sports with Val. (coughs) Evans Agency is here to match you with the best insurance solutions that fit your needs. Whether you need coverage for home, business, auto, or life, Evans Agency will make sure you have the protection you need no matter what life throws your way. With a heart and a hand for friendship, Evans Agency is here for you. Call 574-224-6988 or visit online at www.evansagencyllc.com. Here at Timbercrest Senior Living Community, residents and independent living are able to enjoy an active lifestyle and a beautiful campus. With plenty of activities, including walking and biking paths, fitness classes, and social events, there's always something for residents to engage in to benefit their mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. Contact us today to schedule a tour and discover the active lifestyle and beautiful campus our residents enjoy every day. Say hello to a whole new world of growing possibilities with Nutrien Ag Solutions. Let the experts at Nutrien Ag Solutions help you realize the highest crop yield with the most sustainable solutions possible. Stop by their local location just east of Fulton or call at 574-857-3555 or visit online at www.nutrienagsolutions.com to see how Nutrien can help you. New Holland Rochester knows that farmers need equipment they can trust and rely on. That's why for over 125 years, New Holland has been innovating to develop the best and most sustainable products available for our customers. Check out our full fleet that includes our lineup of small compact tractors online at www.NewHollandRochester.com or stop in at one of our locations in Rochester or Logansport to see how we can serve you. Welcome back here to Talking Sports with Val on a Friday as we wrap things up here with our final two schools. Caston and Tippecanoe Valley, both schools will be opening up their sectional play tonight in the semifinal round. They both had first round buys and they are both hosting sectionals. So mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about the uh, the Vikings first as they're hosting 3A sectional number 16. 
18? The Valley is hosting 3A sectional 18. 18, yeah, yeah 18. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll be taking on Knox pretty handily, uh, defeated them during the regular season. So right. uh, you, would, you would think that the Valley Vikings would, would have an opportunity to get to uh, the championship game. Right, Knox has kind of a big three in terms of Miles McLaughlin, um, Caleb Schwant, and um, Rowan Jordan. All three average between like 8 and 11 per game. Uh, but this is not a high, high-powered high Knox offense. And taking on a Valley defense that is going to have a huge height advantage. I mean, mm-hmm. Valley just has smothered teams. Smothered some really good offensive teams Yeah, at times this year. And Knox only scored 41 in that first meeting. And I think they scored like, I think Knox scored like 20 in the fourth quarter when they were already way behind. Yeah, just to just, make it. Just to get to 41. Yeah. So... Uh, if you're Coach uh, Eskridge, and again, Joe Eskridge is an outstanding coach. He won sectionals at Oregon Davis back in 2015 and 2017. So he knows how to navigate his way through through a sectional, but boy, how do you, fi- how do you find ways to score points against this Valley defense? Yeah. Valley at 15-8, and eight, the only uh, team in this sectional with a winning record. The other yeah. two teams that are playing tonight are Bremen and John Glenn. Of course, John Glenn won this last year, so right. Bream, I think Bremen is ten and twelve, and John Glenn is eleven and thirteen. They played about two weeks ago at John Glenn, and at John Glenn, and Bremen won by thirteen, mm-hmm. forty nine thirty six. John Glenn's coming off a forty seven forty one win over Culver Academy in their quarterfinal game on Tuesday. According to John Harrell, that was an upset, though. It was worth noting that Culver Academy did come into the sectional on a five game losing streak. So again, you don't know. It, it was just a weird. I didn't know what to think of that game because John Glenn had gone one and seven in their last eight games. Yeah. And Culver Academy had gone zero oh and five in their last five games. So it was like, okay, who's the favorite in this game? Uh, again, that's John Harrell picked Culver Academy, but I, I don't think it's a shocker that John Glenn won this game. No, it'll be interesting to see too. Obviously, Glenn is the only team that has a game under their belt, you know, in the in the sectional. So sometimes. When you get that, and and you're the team that lost in the regular season, and then you already have played one game, sometimes it's a little bit of an advantage. Yeah, uh, Bremen coming off a week, you know, a week's rest. They beat Culver fifty-eight to thirty-five last Friday, and they've got kind of that three-headed monster with uh, Divine, Leidig, and uh, Graverson, mm-hmm. and against John. But John Glenn's got that. I don't. I don't know if it's the momentum of having played that game as much as it is that experience with Chase Miller and Joe Shrap Louie. Yeah, yeah. Bremen's fairly young, aren't they? Divine's a freshman. Yeah, I mean, but he's a good player. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be interesting to see. And obviously, yeah. you would think that Valley has the the opportunity to to get a sectional with uh, obviously hosting it, plus being the only team over five hundred. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they can't overlook any of the teams. You know, they've got a Knox team that's coming in tonight, and they're going to be hungry. Right, right, so. absolutely. I mean, Knox, Knox has had a week to prepare for this game as well. So yeah. Knox coming off a loss to Triton last week, but played pretty well defensively in that game. So, again, uh, with with Valley, you're worried about so – again, Valley plays slower than they did last year when they had Cumberland and Kaiser. They play a little slower this year, uh, but uh, I think they're trying – They've been more efficient offensively at times. Now, Ian Cooksey shot the ball very well toward the end of the season. I think he was maybe in a little bit of a slump, but he was shooting better. And Stephen Acasi had 28 against South Bend, Washington last week. They won that game 54-48, to and Stephen had 28. That's an impressive win. Yeah. It really is. And they held Stephen Reynolds of South Bend, Washington to eight points in that yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, you talk about that Valley defense. I mean, he's a potential D1 player, and, and to hold him to eight points, is, yeah. that's big time. Yeah. So. So, so it's, you know, Valley has their big three with Akasi and Cooksey and Riley Shepard. So Valley and Knox will play game one tonight over right. at Valley, and then game two will be Bremen and Glenn, and, of course, the winners will come together tomorrow night for a uh, sectional championship. Right, and that'll be a 7 o'clock sectional championship tomorrow yep. night. Yep. 7 o'clock. Down at uh, down at Caston High School, the uh, Comets uh, they got a, a first round bye, and they will be playing in game number two. So game number one uh, down there will be Frontier taking on Tri County. Um, Tri County, I've seen them play, and Frontier, you know, they they defeated Caston early. Actually, both of those teams have defeated Caston, but. Um, 
you know, Tri County is a really good looking right. team. Saw them again last week, which is week. why we like Caston's draw. Yeah, oh, yeah. They came out. They don't have to play them until... They might have to play Tri County or Frontier, but not both of them. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be a good one there in game one, and then uh, right. Tri County put seventy points on the board against South Newton. Just the third time this year they've scored seventy or more. Yeah, Caston uh, will take on West Central in the second game of uh, of the uh, sectional. There, you got to. You got to think Caston would be uh, slightly favored in that one. Yeah, I saw a little bit of that West Central North White game that we, you know, we. Uh, I know that uh, the guys uh, did that. On, uh, Pete and uh, Blair, Blair did that on mm-hmm. uh, for their for us, and that was a strange one. North White actually beat West Central during the regular season, beat them by one. This sectional game was a rout. I mean, mm-hmm. West Central won fifty five twenty four. So again, I, I think the key for Caston is what is their defensive game plan to Nenenga. We talked about him earlier. He's a thousand point scorer, and then Miller is a guy who can shoot as well. And then their 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 other guy is Grindstaff, who's their freshman point guard. Mm-hmm. You can tell he's going to be a good player. He's just a little small right now, but he's going to, they're going to put, get him in the weight room, and he's going to be a really good player eventually. But he's another kid who can shoot for them. And Nananga is a thousand point scorer, and he's only a junior. Yeah, yeah. So and he's six two. I mean, he's yeah, he's sturdy. You know. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what Kasten does. Again, I think Kasten has more weapons. Uh, and, of course, they beat they scored 80 points against West Central when they played earlier this year. So if you're Coach Odom, how are we going to stop this Kasten offense? Because you've mm-hmm. got to stop the shooters. But then, again, the way that Grant Yaden's been coming along, yeah. and then with Lane Hook, they've got two guys who can score on the inside as well. Yeah, I think Grant Yaden's uh, progression from uh, the first half of the season to the second half of the season was huge. Right. He was getting the position early, but not able to finish. Now he's finishing those those passes and those shots. We we, we talk about the na- the narrative of the season every year, mm-hmm. which is why basketball is so great to to follow because things happen during a season that you just didn't didn't see count that you didn't count on happening. And Grant Yaden's the thing for Caston. Yeah, yeah, he's been big literally mm-hmm. for them. Right, you know, he's a big presence inside and. When he can finish at the rim, that just opens up things for uh, Stinson and for uh, uh, Zyder and yeah, it just uh, and in Hook, you know, he right. he can he can shoot inside, he can go outside and shoot. Right, when and he Stinson, needs to. Stinson's just a nightmare to guard because, I mean, his he was never a bad shooter, but boy, he's become almost as automatic as Zyder out there. Yeah, and you you can't overplay him on the uh, on the perimeter either because he's uh, just as adept at putting the ball on the floor, right, and uh, finishing at the rim, right. So plus he can set up for his teammates. So yeah, yeah. another kid who's been coming on is Reed Summers. Who's been, he's been getting a few more yeah. minutes lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not real big, but boy, is he fast. Yeah, he is super fast, and and he does a great job. And he's he's earned playing time. Yeah, he wasn't even really on varsity at the beginning of the year, and he's he's earned his time. Yeah. So you got to give him credit. Another freshman. Yeah. So again, I think you have to like cast some chances tonight. Uh, mm-hmm. Again. Uh, We'll see if West Central can duplicate that performance, holding North White to 24 points. I just did not see that coming. Yeah. But they're going to have to have a, an even better defensive effort tonight. Yeah. So it should be a good night uh, down at Lewis Cass with uh, 2A. We're uh, at uh, Caston with uh, both games in 1A, and then uh, we'll have uh, both games on the huddle at uh, uh, Tipkin Valley then in the 3A. So, mm-hmm. And then tomorrow night, uh, you and I will uh, it'll just be dependent if uh, – if Pioneer or Winnemac or both win, we will be back down at Lewis Cass. If both of those are out, we'll probably end up over at uh, Tipton Valley. Yeah, assuming that the Vikings uh, are playing. Mm-hmm. But we will definitely have all the all the games down at Caston Blair and Pete. They do a great job. Yeah, uh, I tell you what, it's just Pete's another one. I've talked about the the interns here, Caden, and Caleb, and they do a great job. And Pete uh, is another one that does a, a great job. Yeah. Here. Just really enjoys it, and hopefully, uh, you know, they've talked about trying to keep him close for the, you know, for a couple of years to see what happens there. So, yeah, Pete always asks me about the use of the word barn burner. <laughs> uh, he's a fun one. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple other notes here. I know you wanted to talk about here before we close. Yeah, congratulations to Argus and Samantha Redinger and Cass and Isabel Skills. Both got invited to the top sixty workout. Mm-hmm. It's at Beach Grove High School coming up on Sunday. Uh, Isabel's not going to be able to compete at that. I, I, I'm not sure why not. If she she deserves a day off, yeah, right? yeah. If, if that's why. But yeah. Samantha Redinger is going to be there. So, and by the way, that it's not close to the public. It's open to the public. You can go down to Beach Grove High School and buy a ticket and watch 
if you like. I know usually they have a group for the uh, the, the the northern kids and a group for the uh, the southern kids. So they break it up, but it's mostly just like scrimmaging, I think, mm-hmm. is what they do. So I wanted to mention that. also wanted to mention uh, Samantha Redinger and Isabel Scales of Argus and Kastner, respectively, made the IBCA Small School Senior All-State list. So mm-hmm. only 16 girls in the state made that list. Allie Harness from Carroll made it. Wagner from Carroll made it. Caden Hanley from North Miami made it. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty pretty exclusive list, but it was a lot of kids that we've we've seen a lot over the mm-hmm. past four years. Mm-hmm. And uh, Addison Simple made me the small school senior honorable mention all state list. So mm-hmm. yeah, want to give Addison Simpleman a shout out as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some good stuff yeah. there. But I was thinking about those, those three buzzer beaters at Mrs. Cinema the other night. Mm-hmm. I've been doing this for twenty years. I think I've seen. Probably fewer than ten buzzer beaters in person in my my career. Mm-hmm. To have three buzzer beaters in two nights is just yeah. All three games that they've played have uh, come on uh, shots at the buzzer to win. And you could argue that the underdog team won all three games. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I just for those of you who think who are amazed by that, it's even more amazing than you think. Yeah, because buzzer beaters are not that common in high school basketball. Yeah. So I uh, had a nice little day yesterday. I want to give a you know a little personal here, but uh, took uh, McKenna over to Aurora University, which is in Aurora, Illinois, mm-hmm. on the uh, outskirts of Chicago, um, and uh, had a really good visit there. And uh, she got a uh, a nice offer to to go finish or to go play mm-hmm. for Aurora. They're actually twenty win seasons the last two years. Uh, both of the coaches have been there for. Uh, they'll be going in their six years. So. Mm-hmm. Looks like a really fun program, really cool campus. Is it Division Three? Division Three. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So, uh, I was just proud of her. Just uh, mm-hmm. you know, you never know what's going to happen, and that was our first college visit, and okay, it was a fun day. Because I was hoping she would get some honorable mention. Yeah, mention. Yeah, it's mention, it's tough. mention. Yeah. yeah, you know, looking down the list, uh, I saw on that junior uh, all state list, you know, Carly Barrett from LCC, and, and I know Carly pretty well. She. Uh, played with McKenna when they were younger over at uh, Indiana Best, and good kid there. So mm-hmm. you know, well deserved. She's a she's a heck of a player, a lefty just like Redinger. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, yeah, well deserved. Uh, you know, for uh, Samantha Redinger, you know, just she was so far under the radar. I, I think it's kind of like, you know, the the coaches' polls. You know, if you start out in the top ten, it's harder to get out of the top ten, mm-hmm. or harder to get into the top ten. You know, once you've started, you know, you, you think that, why isn't that team in the top 10? Well, they started at 20, and it's it's hard to work your way up. And yeah. Unfortunately for Sam, she was kind of under the radar, and, I mean, some people are starting to recognize mm-hmm. what she can do. Yeah. So that top 60 is a big deal. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, obviously your, your all-star team is going to only have 12 girls on it, but uh, it's kind of picked – uh, a little bit off of uh, those girls in that top 60. Right. I mean, did Lizzie Edmonds make the top 60? I don't think no, she did. I don't so. think so. Uh, trying to think the last one, I think maybe Courtney Dunlap. That's what I think, yeah. Yeah, was the last one I can remember that was on that. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's a pretty big honor. Yeah. And to have two girls to have uh, Belle and, uh, you know, Sam on there, that's a, it's a big honor. Most years we've had nobody. Yeah. <laughs> Most years. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we had one last year. Yeah, we had one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had one last year. Yeah, we did okay. Yeah, Ashland did well. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's all I've got. Anything else that you want to? I think we we're tapped out. Yeah. So uh, yeah, tune in tonight. Uh, yeah. we'll oh, have... J- Jake Redinger was thirtieth. Jake's Jake Redinger. Jake yeah. Cipher was thirtieth state in the freestyle, five hundred freestyle, five hundred one twenty five. Yeah. So we have four fifty nine at the sectional, five hundred one at the state. Okay. So, good stuff there. So we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, and the and the Valley kids, uh, Carson Parker made it to Saturday in the breaststroke, and the two hundred medley relay made it to Saturday. Okay, I think both uh, the relay was fourteenth uh, and Carson was fifteenth or something like that. Mm. Yeah, so to make it to Saturday is a big deal too. Yeah, in swimming. Yeah, Carmel won their tenth consecutive state championship. Shocker, right? Yeah. <laughs> How many are the girls on? Like. 28? No, it's in the 30s. It's in the 30s. Wow. Yeah, Jeez. 35. Yeah, something yeah. Like 38, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, that's going to do it here for uh, tonight. We'll have uh, coverage from Lewis Cass, from Caston, and from Valley for the uh, sectionals with all of our teams as they uh, seek a sectional championship here for the 2024 or 2023-2024 season. Again, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next week to talk some more sports with Val.